Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us uh, on this webinar. Uh, my name is Jack, and uh, we've also got uh, another Jack, Jack Spurway from RecTech, um, joining us. Um, there's a few people still joining, um, but I can see there's quite a few of you already on, so hello to everybody. Thanks for coming in. Um, Jack, just for a quick round of introductions, you just want to tell people um, a little bit about your, yourself and, uh, and RecTech as well. Yes, indeed. Uh, sorry, my name is Jack Spurway. I work as uh, part of the marketing communications team for RecTech. Uh, we um, uh, uh, have been brought onto this uh, webinar to discuss something that's very close to our heart, which is um, all about the balance between uh, recruitment, technology, and keeping everything um, decidedly human or as human as possible. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've got a fair few topics we obviously want to cover, um, and it's been great to be brought on as part of the Assess Team webinar, uh, Assess First webinar team. And uh, yeah, keen to get started. Good stuff. Um, yeah, and uh, we'll we'll definitely keep the introductions very short and sweet. Uh, so my name is also Jack, uh, part of the team at uh, Assess First, and we do behavioural assessments uh, and recruitment tech. So again, um, this is something that's this uh, pretty close to my heart, and uh, I think yeah, we've got a lot to cover. We've had a couple of questions submitted in as well from a few people, so if we can get around to those, we will. Um, but yeah, essentially, we're going to cover, I guess, a few things around sort of employer brand. We're going to look at some mega trends in technology as well, and is there anything? We can be learning as recruiters or people in HR from those mega trends in technology and then looking more generally than a kind of scaling tech. And again, how do you kind of balance that uh, with human intervention? Um, so, Jack, uh, I guess one of the first things that I wanted to touch on was really around employer brand. So, you know, what are, in, in, you know, in your experience, certainly, what are some of the best <clears throat> ways you've seen using technology to improve the employer brand? um yeah specifically as it relates to hr and recruitment processes yes indeed um so at RecTech, i think because we like i said we sit at the juncture between uh ats providers recruitment crms recruitment technology providers and the wider public be they employers be they agencies um obviously the conversation of employer brand comes up almost every conversation we have be they at trade fairs or be they um with vendors or with customers so um a big thing for us really comes down to at what point does tech do the heavy lifting, stop doing the heavy lifting? Where do those, uh, how, how does integration either uh, work to augment employer branding or where does it feel like it might compromise employer branding? Um, almost every customer, every vendor has their own story really to tell. So um, it's enormously subjective. Um, however, we do believe, I, I'm personally uh, of the belief that tech can't really do the heavy lifting. However, it has to augment and does often commonly augment um, employer brand marketing efforts. Um, and as long as it's not stifling it, I think you're on the right path. Um, a big thing for us, and again, this is going to come up a lot in this webinar, uh, I know, is uh, how tech can really augment uh, the customer, uh, the candidate experience. Uh, mm -hmm. and re-clarify company purpose. Um, I, I think for that, you know, um, recruitment tech has to make any recruitment process, which well, got to be painless, it's got to be quick, it's got to be personal, it's got to be data-driven, it has to be fair, it has to be as unbalanced as possible. These are all things that tech can help. Recruitment tech does this now, I think, um, especially when you look at the myriad ATSs on the market, you look at the enormous amount of innovation in the market, um, the, it's pivoting in the right way. But you always want to come back to a great example for me. Um, I think a good example of kind of how a brand has used what we already use, I think on a common basis. Um, uh, so video, good social, consistent messaging, great marketing, um, a little bit of in, in influencer heft um, and how that kind of works to speak towards a recruitment process. If you're a candidate, you don't know about how the process is going to work for you really until you've traversed the employer branding part, got through that first stage and spoken to someone. So how does tech do that? So for me, I'm going to go to one of my favorite brands ever. It's Tony's Chocoloni. I think Tony's Chocoloni are great. Um, they've done something I think that is both fun, um, but it speaks to their wider purpose. So um, they're a fun brand. Everybody knows who Tony's Chocoloni is. But if you look at their manifesto film and their career page, you look at the product, you look at the fact that it's luxurious without being alienating. You also look at the fact they're incredibly ethically, like purposefully driven. Um, their, their career page, you know, um, video is narrated by Idris Elba. Everything is focused on their core purpose of reducing the supply chain exploitation. That's their mission. So coupled with their quite personal and fun careers page, their personalized shop, their press coverage, their fair commitments, 
spot on social is basically they haven't complicated anything. Tech has been used at the first point of contact to make everything easily communicable, very, very clear on their purpose. So that speaks to everything that's going to come next. And I think that's what that's where employer branding and tech need to intersect first and primarily. Yeah, I, I yeah, I love Tony's. <laughs> the, the, I think the I guess it's it's sort of linked really to employer brand and in, increasingly so is that the raging debate around remote work, which to some extent is kind of tired, but we've seen that shift one way and then shift the other. Um, and in many ways, you know, there was there were technologies that facilitated remote work, right? So you know, Slack, Zoom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and on the other hand, I think uh, remote work facilitated the growth of a lot of that tech. But given that the the debate is quite it's shifting and there's there's kind of two camps that have emerged and then there's also the camp in the middle of hybrid. Do you think that impacts how companies should be using and talking about the technologies that they use in the hiring process? Like fundamentally, you know, using video interviewing software, for example, that was amazing in remote when, when we had to be. Is that a good thing for an employer brand or a candidate experience or a bad thing? Yeah. How do you see that kind of playing out at the moment? Uh, yeah, I think it does. I think it's one of the... Um... Uh, especially when it comes to candidate comms, it's almost the first thing you should be considering. Or, I mean, everybody knows this now. We're three years post-pandemic, or I say post-pandemic, we're sort of three years beyond that sea change moment where a lot of these tools were brought in, invested in, rolled out at scale. Everybody had to adapt. So with that in mind, I kind of lean on a couple of points that um, I think maybe speak to the uh, sort of wider movement towards te- technology, especially in comms, so video tech uh, as, a, as, a, as an example, uh, one of which is, According to Standout CV, there's been a 57% increase in the use of video interviews between 2019 and 2022. And as per Indeed, quite recently, in 2022, there was 82% of employers said they now use virtual interviews. So just using that as an example, you can't mm. avoid, you have to talk about how technology is now within both your recruitment process, as in, in which stage you are going to be expected to or asked to or Um, or or in some way involved in a digital solution to a kind of remote part of the interview. Um, So you can't avoid it. In our our kind of, you know, in our realm, we think, um, yes, providers are are, are not pushing it. I think it's now an expectation. It's kind of par for the course. Um, But a big thing, obviously, is about setting standards during recruitment and how they impact the overall culture of remote work or hybrid work or hub and spoke arrangements. I'll go, but we go back to uh, first impressions count, always first impressions count. If you implement remote hiring stages, communicate why you do that to your candidates. So uh, are you trying to reach out to kind of, you know, more of a borderless community of workers within your sector? If so, video interviews are a really big point of that. But make sure you kind of clarify at what stage that sort of becomes human, more personal, hyper personalized and try and fit a way of, uh, of, of communicating that um, because you don't want to communicate uh, communicate your overcomplicating the process or making it too difficult, um, which speaks again to an, a, another conversation really about multi-stage interviews. Are people doing too many? Um, so there's a big thing there. Um, but yes, you can't. You literally can't avoid the conversation. You have to have to have it. Um, I've actually got a question. Um, I, for, I've, I've, yeah, I was, well, was going to say, I'll put you on the spot. Let's, let's switch it around. No, okay. um, um, I was going to say, to put on that, on the what you mentioned there about the facilitation of technology quite recently into recruitment and into general work and culture of the work. So in your, in, in your aspect and in the role that you do, where do you think the next big revolutionary moment is coming uh, within tech, uh, advancement within HR, recruitment, and the management of people? Because you've mentioned, you know, just then you mentioned technology um, in terms of, recruitment and, and video interviewing but you know yeah where do you think that's what do you think that's going to look like to candidates going forward yeah so um w- whether it's a 12 month 18 month or, or 36 month uh cycle to, to get here i think that it's really all going to be around predictive analytics so um there's actually a book called predictive uh, hr analytics uh dr martin edwards um which is which is pretty good um, but I think like you touched on it earlier, right? Like there's this myriad of ATS, CRM, HRIS, video into in, interviewing software, which essentially is just giving us a bunch of data. And that data is really powerful to give people more personalized, better candidate experience. And at the moment, I think generally organizations are doing a good job of using that data to make better decisions about what they're doing in the short term. But in terms of, you know, if you look at 
other areas of technology, how can we take that data and use it for predictive purposes? And I think that that trend, I, think, I know, again, pre-COVID, that almost three quarters of companies in the UK called Deloitte were going to be investing more in people analytics. There's more recent studies to say that that number is still huge. HR leaders in particular know that this is an area that they want to invest in. But if they're going to be investing there, they really need to be looking at how can we make this predictive? Um, so I think that's kind of the next evolution. Um, yeah, and, and that's obviously something that, you know, we, we do assess first as well. So that that's kind of why I'm drawn to that area, I think. Um, I think just very specifically on candidates real quick, I think if, if to, to draw out an example of where a company can be using that, so where, where it's done well, it should enable companies, right, to make better predictions about the types of people that they might want to hire. So they can better identify, target, and advertise those jobs in a more personalized way. So I think actually for a candidate, if you're sat there on social media and you're seeing jobs or companies or employer brands being advertised to you, then I think it's a really interesting time for candidates because if companies are using predictive analytics, then a candidate can be sat there and thinking, well, why are they advertising this to me? Even right. if it's in a field I'm not currently in, even if it's in a location where I'm not currently based, they must be advertising this to me because they believe that there's a prediction of me being successful as a candidate in this company. So I think for candidates, um, yeah, they should have their finger on the pulse of this as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. I was actually gonna say, going back to the first question you asked even regarding this, when it comes to employer branding and that passive candidate um, potential, if you will, uh, talent-based potential, um, and referring back to tech, I mean, do you think, well, where do you think employers do go wrong? I mean, it, when it comes to employer branding and making sort of those mistakes or, or you know, how they can how they can look to forward in in that regard and in, in that context of um, of candidates being maybe more aware and uh, and more um, I, I guess a little bit more mindful of how those processes work for them. So I mean, where do you think? I mean, do you think do you think employers are going to are going to lean too hard on tech to fill those gaps? Or do you think they're going to kind of take a step back and go, oh, we'll let this sort of predictive, um, automated sort of marketing go out and, and sort of forget the human part because it works. We know it works. I mean, where, where do you, yeah. Think, yeah, how do you think that works? So I, again, I'd like employer branding, candidate experience always comes right at the top of the pile, right? Especially in UK, EMEA, um, in terms of priorities. And I think fundamentally it's because I th most organizations, I would argue, certainly below kind of FTSE level, um, don't necessarily always do a great job of their employer brand. And it is very generic. Um, and I think increasingly people see through it, right? Um, mm -hmm. Big companies that are claiming to save the planet and have these green investments while simultaneously killing the planet with other initiatives, like people see through it. Um, and that's ultimately going to be damaging to an employer brand. I mean, you can... If you're interested, you know, you can go on ChatGPT, type in a couple of commands, ask what a good employer brand looks like for a certain demographic in the UK for a certain type of role, get a bunch of answers, turn that into a job advert and put it out. But I think that ultimately is a race to the bottom. And that is where people go wrong because what it's lacking, and I say this as a marketer uh, in HR tech, is the authenticity. So I think the lesson, if people are thinking about employer brand, use tech to leverage as much as you possibly can. But the real key component of an employer brand are the people within your business to bring that to the fore. So uh, one example is a couple of years old, but like my favorite, I think, example of a firm doing that well was Airbnb when they had their Belong Anywhere campaign. And again, they kind of tied it into their whole mission and purpose, but they essentially brought people from within the organization at different levels and they campaigned around it and they brought the people within the business to the front of their employer brand and if people are claiming to do an employer brand or do things around benefits or that's mission-based but actually you don't really know who works there or why they work there or what they do right. and who they are and how they manage people that's the stuff that candidates are really interested in so that can only be achieved through non-automated processes absolutely so that's where is a big learning curve for people. Yeah, I think the advocacy um, uh, culture, if you will, is is yeah is is an eternally powerful product um, yeah. product to use within recruitment marketing for sure. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. I was, yeah. I was gonna, I mean, 
it kind of touches on it, Jack. And I, I don't know how, I, I guess from a recruitment, yeah, marketing perspective, you know, if, if we focus in on social, which I think we, we were saying before, actually, just before we came on here, is probably a whole webinar series in itself. Absolutely. You know, social has obviously changed significantly right over the years. People are now experimenting mm -hmm. with, with TikTok and have been for the last sort of 18, uh, 24 months. What, what do you think is behind, I guess, some of the, <clears throat> the trends that we're seeing in social? Do you think companies are taking full advantage of the, you know, the social landscape for recruitment goals? Um, is there more that companies can be, can be kind of doing there? Um, and also, I think, like, are there risks, right, with just focusing in on social recruitment? Is it fundamentally a good or a bad thing? Yeah, uh, well, two, I mean, two sort of two answers to that exact question. Um, are are, are uh, employers doing enough or um, there's never enough you can do? I mean, that's the kind of nature of the beast. Unfortunately, you keep scrolling and you keep you keep going is that, you know, there's never enough content. Keep it, keep it going. Um, but not to be too facetious. Um, I think there comes down to there's a, there's there's obviously huge demographic uh, generational um, user base uh, differences in I'll, everything from the kind of moral usage of social media to the daily engagement to um, everything. Like you said, it's an enormous, enormous topic. But again, coming back to kind of basics of where we see the primary driver of social and maybe where we feel they're a sort of driving attitude or an attitudinal foundation for how you should approach it. Um, digital natives are no fools. Like what you've just said a minute ago, you can't fool people online who are digitally engaged. Um, you, you can't, uh, for want of a better word, um, lie as easily as you could so i think with that in mind um that can and has driven some element of reticence i think to fully fully go in on social media i think a lot of people feel that there's a disconnect between how we operate professionally and how we operate on social because i think there is a wider i mean i i could be wrong it's just my opinion really um but i think that there's a wider uh, uh, feeling that if you approach employer branding or a careers page or building a career or representing a career or trying to develop a career as an employer to a candidate as a trend, you're somewhat cheapening it. And, and I do agree with that. I, I think you, you can't treat people's careers like a trend. I, I think even the language and the way we refer to it perhaps, perhaps is a little bit demeaning. And I think maybe that can be one, can put the stoppers on, well, how do we then really fully engage with social? How do we integrate social? You know, I mean, People have been, you know, using LinkedIn for years, but because there is this kind of wider meta understanding that LinkedIn is still a professional space. Yes, there are people, there are outliers, and there are some fantastic content makers on there that do break the mold. Um, but I think, um, I mean, yeah, we barely scratch the surface, I think, especially when it comes to video, especially when it comes to uh, recruitment and how uh, the crux of, well, whatever the content is, does it tie to your employer branding? Does it tie to your purpose? You know, is this just a trend? Is this kind of a snapshot of who you are and it's kind of something to get the algorithm on your side? Or is this speaking your language? Again, you know, you go back to what Airbnb were doing. Are your people talking about you? Are they advocating for you on social media? Is there this whole interconnected community of people speaking positively about your brand? If you've got a fantastic byline written and your and, and, and your kind of MD or your kind of CM, you know, CM, CMO or something is absolutely killing it on LinkedIn, but the rest of the company are completely dead silent. Mm. You as a candidate may look a little bit critically on that. You might go, fab, the press is great, but what are the people saying? You know, and I think there's there's, there's the mis, 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 misdirect maybe. Um, it, it, like a, it's a huge thing. Um, I think, yeah, like I said, there's two things there. There's a generational shift in uh, how people read content online and what they want from it. And I think there's also maybe some reticence about how to really fully commit to communicating purpose and EB online that I think it, we're, again, it, it, we're in, almost in, um, uh, we're scratching the surface. I think there's, there's more to come. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah, I mean, <laughs> employer brand candidate experience social is, is such a huge bit and I'm conscious we've spent. <laughs> yeah. It's a huge, <laughs> it's a huge thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. We, we had other questions that I'm just not going to be able to, to kind of get, get to really yeah. from people that no no it's okay you know what? I, I, I wanted to almost I'll, I'll steal you for a second actually and ping one back at you really in about trends again we spoke about trends in social and and how and how th that can uh, d perhaps dominate the recruitment marketing landscape anyway so from your perspective what can we learn from mega trends so mega trends in tech you mentioned it right at the beginning of this webinar um how can those be applied to development of recruitment processes from your perspective okay 
Um, I'm instantly thinking of mega pints now. Um, <laughs> just, yeah, mega <laughs> trends. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm a, so I'm so my background, I guess, before kind of assess first and HR tech was deep tech, AI, you know, startups, scale ups, and uh, DevOps as well, and, and really kind of under the hood of technology. And I'm a big fan of looking over here, seeing what's happening over here and thinking, okay, how can we adapt that in a different industry in a different place? And I think actually, if we look at the trend just of the web, so that's massive, right? And if we look at how the web has evolved from 1.0 to 2.0 to web 3.0, which is on its way, there are some parallels with recruitment and HR. So web 1.0, very static, static web pages, you read it. Recruitment, you've got static job boards, you know, newspaper ads. Web 2.0 is more social. It's a little bit more interactive, which kind of, I guess, is probably where we're at now in recruitment and HR. It's kind of web 2.0. It's a little bit interactive. It's a little bit social. It's a little bit TikTok, a little bit LinkedIn. We talked about employer brand, you know, and careers pages. But if we look at where the web is going in terms of 3.0, there are probably three well, there's, there's a couple of pillars, but if I pick out three, there's hyper-personalization of web, web 3.0, there's interconnectivity and there's transparency, and they're kind of three fundamental bits that will underpin the direction of the web. So if we just take those three bits real quick, so we, if we look at personalization, as an organization, you know, we should be asking ourselves, are we hyper-personalizing every single piece of our recruitment process? If we are, that's aligned with how this mega trend of the web is going. Interconnectivity, again, you talked about this myriad right at the start of ATS and all these systems, and it's amazing. But there is a risk that if you end up having all of these systems, and I would also class departments in this as well, but they're not interconnected, they're not talking to one another, they're not sharing data, then that gives you a huge risk. I mean, yeah, that I mean, the, the events, I think, just over the weekend with SVB Bank and like the, the risk to a lot of tech startups. Right. If you're fully reliant on one system and it's not connected to anything else, um, but it underpins the spine of your organization and that is taken away from you, then where do you go? Whereas if you've got an interconnected system, which relies on different modular things, where if you can slot one thing out and you can put one thing in very easily, that is kind of paralleled with where the web will go. And the final one is about transparency. So in the web, that's going to be, probably be underpinned by blockchain. I'm not suggesting we all have to buy crypto to be recruited. But I think if we look at transparency and recruitment, you know, we need to basically ask ourselves, is every part of this process auditable? So are the pieces of our recruitment process, HR process, going on to onboarding as well? Can we objectively look at each step in that process and audit them? to know whether we've made a decision that is based on fact and it's objective. And ultimately, just by making sure something is auditable, that will enable us to get, you know, to a place of transparency, which is then going to fuel all our, all our DE and I kind of goals. So I think, yeah, if there was one kind of massive takeaway, it's a big topic for me, I'm really passionate, but I think yep. I would look to Web 3.0 and I would ask myself three things um, coming off this webinar, actually. Is my recruitment process transparent is it interconnected do i have different systems that are talking to one another and if not why not um you know they're just kind of some of the things that i yeah i'd be looking at really yeah yeah i'd almost add a i would almost add a fourth one on there it's actually a point that i think uh comes down to kind of the <coughs> excuse me sorry the challenges of of of, of kind of scaling and, and sort of and and bringing on new um Fit sort of features into a recruitment tech stack and, and kind of how you feel into, you know, how you feel um, that the process could be improved by bringing on um, a, uh, a new feature, a new tool. Um, and it comes down to also remembering the human part elements of it. Like you said, if these data sets aren't speaking to each other, you can't analyze it, it's almost worthless. But if your people also don't understand quite why, um, if your consultant teams, your departments, if your candidates even don't understand why these extra stages have been added or why suddenly something's more digital or remote than previously, um, uh, how, how it was previously iterated, you're going to find, you know, a complete misalignment within your teams a misalignment between your marketers, for instance, and your teams, your business developers, your 
um, your consultants on the ground, your resor- you know resources in all the way up the chain. And I think, yeah, that I, I completely agree with the the the, the, the factoring in a, a sort of audit and how to look at transparency and, and and your stack and how it all integrates and works is is absurdly important. Yeah, well, I mean, you've, you've just mentioned a few things there. I mean, if if we kind of zone in just just on ATS, because I know you spend a lot of time uh, in your day job. So if you know when. You know, what, what would you say are the things that people are overlooking or that they really need that help with or, the, you know, are the core challenges when they're looking for something like an ATS, which is, a, you know, is a massive undertaking for, for some people. Like, are there, what are the conversations that are being had there? Like, what, what are the things that they, they could be overlooking when they're Gosh. just going, yeah, I'm going to say to us? Yeah. Oh, I mean, there are so many and it's almost sector by sector. You could break down those pain points. Um by almost by industry and then almost by company and i think there are so many demographic there are so many um uh, industry kind of niche issues that need to be either worked on or fixed i mean i'd like to think about it from a from a position of, of my own experience which actually you know has been working in places where a very very effective personal recruitment processes have been run from an excel sheet and it's worked you know if it ain't broke don't fix it because there's there's just this whole style that works it's uh, it, it's 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 actually quite um, it was, you know, a small agency setting or um, or within hospitality, for instance, where actually um, those technical advancements uh, don't really help because actually a lot of the process was incredibly analog. A lot of it was walk-ins with CVs. And so a lot of it didn't need to be digital. It was immediate. And it was process-led. And, uh, sorry, not very process-led in, insofar as there are all these enormous tools that can help, um, uh, say, mass uh, recruitment of, you know, warehouse staff for kind of, you know, new um, facilities facilities in sort of you know mega facilities and things like that there's i mean to be to be honest i think it comes down to kind of how can tech it's not really i guess how how ats's aren't doing the job or maybe where they drop the ball per se it's more it comes back to an order i think if you don't quite know what you want in the same way that if you can't improve your cx or your eb if you don't quite know how your audience your candidates, your user are speaking about you, referring to you. You can't really implement the right ATS, the required recruitment CRM, um, the right onboarding yeah. tool. And, and of course, it comes down to a little bit of the human on, um, uh, the human relationship you have with your partner actually at the vendor you're using. If they are maybe not that great, if they kind of don't really understand your pain points and your industry too well, you're just going to find clashing, batting, you know, butting at heads. Um, there are obviously a lot of um, uh, uh, issues around, I wouldn't say issues necessarily, but questions of scale um, that, that, that crop up. But again, every industry is different. It's it's so difficult to even answer that just like in a few minutes, you know, it's a, yeah. incredibly difficult. But no, I do, I, I do, I was going to say, I do just want to mention one thing, which is, yeah, yeah. I think maybe what, maybe where there's one part that I think is going to really revolutionize, you mentioned OpenAI and ChatGPT, even yesterday, their fourth iteration was released, which I think for me is absolutely revolutionized how actually we can almost de-border recruitment purely through NLP multi-language um, feedback now with chatbots and AI and how that's going to feed in. That can absolutely massively change how ATSs are going to work when it comes to implementing, say, for instance, you bring in uh, an ATS with a, a fantastic kind of um, social media product, say, and it's going to bring in a lot of fantastic cl- uh, uh, candidates for you to vet and source and everything. But if you're off, off or nearshoring, your software engineers, for instance, and there's always been a bit of a, maybe a language barrier or a slight um, a slight issue around how to connect with as many candidates as possible, um, away from affinity bias and away from the biases that, you know, uh, come down to, you know, language barriers and everything. If ChatGPT4 can take that out of it, which I think it probably will, I mean, the future is enormous. And I think, you know, you're just in, instantly diversifying a massive candidate base. Um, so in a way that, I mean, yeah, ask me in six months that question, it would be entirely different. Yeah. No, no. I, and I think, I, I guess that was one of the reasons why we wanted to bring this together, right? Because there's, there are so many seminal moments, I think, in tech. Open AI is probably at the heart of that conversation right now. Yeah. Um, and the, yeah, the possibilities and the, the opportunities that unlocks are uh, almost unfathomable, I think, at the moment. Uh, mm. I couldn't say that unfathomable you're a word guy like you can help me with that you know you know <laughs> but i think I, I saw something really interesting i think uh it was either yesterday the day before how candidates can use chat gpt as well yeah, to quite, effectively quite. scrape 
and personalize um, their outreach to internal recruiters. And I mean, you could end up in this dystopian hell of <laughs> GPT from employer brands and employers talking to chat GPT prompts from candidates. And at some point, and I think this is the point of it, right? Yeah, yeah. That gives candidates enormous opportunity to reach employers that they could never have reached before and vice mm-hmm. versa for employers. But at some point, we need to break out of that chat GPT cycle. And it's just about asking yeah. when we do that. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a massive, it's a, it's a, it, the potential is enormous. And I think when you look at, especially from a diversity and a, and a sort of inclusivity perspective, um, not using it would seem like you're really shooting yourself in the foot. Um, but like you said, yes, you're sort of mindful. I'm always mindful of, um, of, of leaning too much on, not even leaning too much on it. I think it's relying on it. I think it's kind of assuming those sort of tools are going to have your best interests at heart. But again, the usability of chat GPT three, four, five, six, and as it goes on is really comes down to how accurate and how brilliantly your prompt is and how, well, you can sort of discern that information, perfect that information, and then communicate it to your audience base. Now, ChatGPT can't do that, only a person can. So I think that's sort of as a metaphor for how everybody should and continue to integrate with recruitment tech really. Um, I'm, almost, I'm preaching to the converted here, to be honest, because most people already know that, but it's 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 always worthwhile to reiterate, um, well, to never, yeah, never. Yeah, and I, I'm just, I'm conscious of time, but I had to, um, and there, there was there was somebody that, that popped in with a, a question that, was specific to their recruitment goals and they essentially are a, an in-house recruiter for uh, for a KO organization and they were they were sort of asking about the role specifically that ta- technology could play in that and mentioning about kind of some of their diversity goals as well and sure. I, I, I just wanted to touch on it because they, they took the time in in that it comes back to what you were saying there about designing that strategy in the first place because if you just look at care mm-hmm. I think it's like 80% of care workers are, are female. And a, a majority of those are sort of in, a, in an older generation age bracket. So on one hand, even if you just look yeah. at big demographics like that, like age and gender, that yeah. maybe could define one candidate experience, could define one chat GPT prompt and one employer yes. brand strategy. But yeah. for yeah. care specifically, you've yeah. also got a proportion of workers that are actually of a much younger age demographic. And it's a significant portion. It's like 23, mm. 24% of care workers yep. are under the age of 34. So mm-hmm. that is probably going to be a very different candidate experience. So it comes back to, like yep. you say, it's that initial audit of what are we trying to achieve here before Absolutely. we then deploy this tech. Yeah, and I was going to say, even there are words that kind of get fed into those, especially with younger recruitment processes around um or so I wouldn't say younger, sorry, maybe more contemporary recruitment processes around um, how tech is moving into a place that is for engagement. So immersive tech or VR, or um, <clears throat> I guess it's how that intersects with it as well, is that that's going to, like you said, if there's path one for a certain candidate kind of map and there's path two for another candidate map and path three and path four, and there's a, an enormous spread. I mean, I'll bounce that question back to you. I mean, do you think, do you think, do you think naturally we should be leaning on these kind of new newfangled techn- you know technological solutions to you know engagement and entertainment and fact finding and communications i mean do we think is there too much like i know that's kind of maybe a slightly negative way to end this webinar but like do you think that yeah we can end on that no it's too yeah, much it's it, done. It, it, um you know we, we yeah we've got uh, just just under one minute to wrap up before we we sort of say our goodbyes um so for those who are still with us um, thank you for staying staying the course um, it is it is too much. I'll, I'll give a straight answer. Um, I frequently say to my wife, when I retire, I'm, I'm going to take my mobile phone and I'm just going to throw it in the bin yeah. <laughs> in, an, in an ethical way. Um, because, yeah, it, it is too much. Um, it's about finding the right tool for, as you say, the, the right candidate yeah. or the right person at the right time. Um, and just jumping onto trends is very dangerous. Like, if we jumped on the trend of virtual reality, for example... Um, we would have jumped on that trend in, I think it was 1967 or 1968. <laughs> right, when the, right, right. When the first VR headset came out and it was yeah. like this massive thing hanging from a ceiling that you put on, it was really heavy. Um, but of course we didn't do that. And for good reason, because we're 60 years down the line and VR is still not that well adopted really by your average consumer. I think it's less than 5% in the UK, um, I think. So 
no, we shouldn't just be jumping on the next trend. What we should be doing is we should be trying to engage with the workforce, with the candidates, finding out who they are, using predictive analytics, coming back to my earlier point, to think about what are the best ways that we can get them. For some people, that might be an immersive VR kind of interview experience. But if you're in your late 50s, looking to do part-time care work, yeah. putting on a VR headset as part of that experience might not really be for you. So it comes Indeed. back to that all that you mentioned, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think there's that sort of, that 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 urgency and and and, and personalization of, of how that relationship between recruiter and candidate really exists. I think if anything's pulling away from that, um, maybe don't, don't bin it, but certainly audit it. I, think, well, <clears throat> I feel like the inclusion of this whole thing is kind of, don't be afraid of auditing your stack and how it works. Speak to your candidates, speak to your audience, speak to your advocates and your and your and your and your, your team as well about how all of this works and reflects on them and how they can help the, the, the process along as well. Sure. Um, we've purposely not made this a, a sales webinar track. Um, okay. If somebody wanted to get in touch with with Rectech or were looking at ATS or anything else, what uh, what, what would you suggest that they do um, with regard to <laughs> Yes, <clears throat> quite well. Um, a lot of the conversation we've obviously spoken about today has been about, I guess, analyzing your options, looking at what is going to work for you as a employer. <clears throat> and it's also going to um, uh, find a way of, of being able to use the tools at your disposal in the most effective way to connect with your candidates. So um, Rectech uh, was founded on a product uh, called Rectech Compare. Rectech Compare is uh, one of the world's only um, ATS comparison site or ATS and recruitment CRM comparison site. So um, as we say at almost every trade fair on every bit of marketing spiel, um, there are enormous amounts of innovation in the market. There are over 450 mm -hmm. ATS providers in the country. Um, we work with an enormous suite of vendors from, you know, as, as assessment and AR companies all the way to onboarding companies and our primary Product is our vendor market of ATS and CRM um, providers. We're completely objective. So the idea is that if you're looking for some of these new products, if you don't quite know where, you need to start improving and start working on your tech stack. And if you if you find yourself just on Google, just shopping for ATSs, I'd say come to us first. Start with us, have a look at what we can provide. Um, we've got an enormous kind of year of new product that we're going to be releasing as well. 2023 is going to be a huge year for us. And um, so, yeah, come to rectech.io uh, um, and check out Rectech Compare um, if you are on the shop for a new ATS or recruitment CRM. Start with us. Um, with the branded polo shirt or, or sweater to, to boot always, as well. So um, Always. Um, thank you to everybody um, on. So, yeah, Rectech, go, um, go check them out. Um, thank you, as I say, to everybody that stayed the course um and for those who maybe joined halfway through or had to drop out um this recording will make its way to you um in the coming days or week um and we'll see you on the other side speak soon cheers for now Thanks, bye, -bye.